Second, 2021 uh, City Council Special Meeting. Uh, we have, uh, first of all, a public hearing, the Laurel Park Sphere of Influence Boundary Annexation Agreement. So, um, speaker, you are going to lead on this one. Yes, ma'am. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, <clears throat> Good afternoon. You have before you a draft agreement, interlocal agreement, an annexation agreement proposed to be entered between the city and Laurel Park. Um, the purpose of this agreement is basically to establish a sphere of influence and come to an agreement over where the city is going to annex versus where Laurel Park is going to annex if asked to annex. It's all voluntary. It would, apply only for voluntary annexations um, but in order to enter into this type of agreement you have to have a public hearing you've got to have a boundary established there is a map that's attached that establishes that boundary there's a very link lengthy legal description if this is approved it would get recorded at the courthouse so everybody would know whether they're in or out of the boundary um, the agreement also does provide that if um, while this is in place, it's proposed for a five-year term, but it does propose that during that five years that if anyone inside that sphere of influence boundary wanted sewer service from the city, they would have to either already be in the corporate limits of Laurel Park or become in the corporate limits by being annexed, by petitioning for annexation. Does anyone have any questions? <clears throat> Uh, Madam Clerk, has this public hearing been... Turn it on. Uh, Madam Clerk, has this public hearing been advertised in accordance with general statutes? Yes, Mayor. Right. So we will open this public hearing. Mayor O'Kane, would you like to uh, say a few words? Well, thank, thank you for having us. You know, we've had a long relationship with the city. Um, this this map that we've come up with is nothing new. It's, it goes back decades. Don't be afraid. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not. It, it goes back decades. The the most recent that I could come up, come up with was uh, in the early 2000s, also in 1995. It's just a, a culmination of. of a boundary agreement. It, this is not an a annexation, much like uh, Mrs. Beaker uh, mentioned. The intent is to maintain a uh, mutually beneficial and friendly cooperative attitude with the city so that we, the town of Laurel Park and, and the city of Hendersonville, we don't squabble over properties, you know, potential pro properties. And I, I think it just is a clarification of a manner in which we can move forward so this is uh, this is not a land grab and I'm not aware I am not aware of any imminent affected properties for annexation with regard to this um, we were both Laurel Park and Hendersonville were urged to come up with this map uh, many years ago and it was being driven by past chairman um, Grady Hawkins and he was urging us to do this for there was the there was the intent within the state to do away with ETJs extraterritorial jurisdictions and chairman McGrady uh, chairman Hawkins suggested that we go ahead and finalize this map agreement it was also represented by our state representative Chuck McGrady was urging us to complete this well as we were finalizing the water agreement last year it was important that well we just didn't have time to finish off the map and so that's why it's come about now you know I, I want to point out you know for those those people that are listening that there are some beautiful benefits to being in a municipality the municipality has buying power I'll give you an example we uh, we do trash collection. The average resident pays $9.50 per household per month. I, I cannot imagine getting that done any cheaper. 
but that's because we have buying power. Part of being a municipality is the idea that you will furnish services. Well, both Hendersonville and Laurel Park furnish a tremendous number of services, including snow plows, maintaining and owning roads, utilities, trash collection, brush collection, leaf collection, fire protection, and police service. Our, you know, our police department will do a free, free security check if you are going out of town. You just have to let the, let the town police department know. And they will come by your house once a day. And at least once a week walk around your property at no cost. So just a reminder, this is not an annexation request. We are always looking forward to the future to try to figure out what we should do best. And I want to wish, I want to thank the uh, city of Hendersonville for having us here today. Wish everyone a great Thanksgiving and, and uh, a very safe holiday. So thank you. Thank you. Um, no one signed up ahead of time for comments at the public hearing. Does anyone wish to comment? Who is it in the room? If not, we do have two digital comments that came in. First is from J. Michael Edney, 333 North Overlook Terrace, Hendersonville. And his comment is, I am upset that we have not been provided a copy of the proposed ordinance and it is not available on your website. I object to being forced into a voluntary annexation by Laurel Park just to be considered for sewer service, which I would then actually pay to have installed. I object to the city of Hendersonville supplanting the state legislature by granting the town of Laurel Park power not authorized by state law to wit force annexation. Second digital comment was from Troy Drake, 708 Davis Circle, Hendersonville. I am opposed to the current annexation agreement between Hendersonville and Laurel Park proposed at this hearing. The boundary line for the agreement is large and wide. Residents involved have not been adequately contacted, and it requires a homeowner to request annexation to get sewer service. It is an attempt being rushed by Laurel Park because they don't want community involvement by the homeowners affected. I do not vote in Laurel Park and I do not pay Laurel Park taxes, yet I am being co coerced by Laurel Park to annex my property in order to get approval for a sewer line if needed. I can only assume that we will see spot annexation in unincorporated Henderson County, Hendersonville ETJ and Laurel Park ETJ districts, which are included within the boundary if you want a new sewer connection in the next five years while this agreement lasts. The boundary shown is not acceptable and at a minimum a letter should be sent to all homes outside of the Laurel Park town limits within the boundary so that those being affected understand the consequences of this annexation agreement. It should not be a requirement that if you want a sewer connection you are required to be annexed into Laurel Park. Thanks for your consideration. Okay. So, uh, Hearing those, uh, we will close the public Matter, hearing. Um, you have one person online, Glenn oh, Ingram. Sorry. I forgot about that. Excuse me. Yes, please go ahead. Sorry, I was muted. Um, I'm Glenn Ingram of Hendersonville. Our property is listed on page 16 of the uh, draft agreement along with 251 others. And um, we've had experience dating back to mid-2017 uh, fighting off, frankly, uh, zoning I issues primarily surrounding the, the lot at 1515 Brevard Road. And I can tell you from firsthand door-to-door -door experience that the, the properties listed here that are all within Hendersonville's ETJ authority People don't have any interest in annexation, whether today 
or quite frankly, years from now. And I appreciate uh, Mayor O'Kane's uh, description of what comes with annexation, but quite frankly, for our communities uh, in unincorporated uh, Henderson County, we, we're not interested. Now, the county sent a letter to the Laurel Park Town Council on November 19th. And let me read from it briefly, quote, it appears that this agreement will identify an area of the county which Laurel Park intends to annex in the future. Henderson County opposes all coerced annexation. While the county understands that this agreement does not annex property, property immediately, it does declare intention to expand the boundary of your municipality into the unincorporated area of the county. The board believes that citizens in the county's jurisdiction should be allowed to make their own decision regarding whether to be included in municipal expansion plans. As the elected representatives of Henderson County residents, the board would welcome a discussion about clarifying your boundaries and request that you do not approve the annexation agreement. I mean, Mr. Edney and Mr. Drake uh, both capture our sentiment, so I'll just briefly come to the conclusion, come to the end here. Um, this matter should be discussed more fully and at a time that doesn't collide with the holiday season. I mean, the previous agreement, which according to John Conant and the copy that John shared with me dates back to 1995, was due to sunset five years later. So it's been 21 years since anything has been put in place, notwithstanding uh, Commissioner Hawkins' encouragement to do that. Now I've had many conversations with Chuck uh, McGrady and in his own words, to paraphrase, Chuck considers the ETJ concept a dinosaur uh, that uh, we should get rid of. Now, I'll, we'll, we'll deal with that hopefully at a later time, but I think for right now, uh, let's table this agreement, take it up at a time when we're not bumping into uh, other personal interests that the vast majority of people in the community have this time of year, and, and give Hendersonville the opportunity if thus far hasn't taken up, that is to properly communicate with the property owners in its own ETJ that they oversee. Thank you for your time today. Okay, thank you. Is there anyone else seeking recognition? Yes, ma'am, Ken Fitch. Okay. Uh, Ken Fitch, 1046 Patton Street. The ETJ issue has been discussed back and forth for some years. However, now we are confronted with a frenzy of high density development projects that are targeting ETJ areas throughout the county, where a majority of existing ETJ residents would be single family home property owners who now find themselves subject to development proposals that are inconsistent and incompatible with the neighborhood in which they reside. The frustration for, the, for these residents is that major decisions affecting their homes and their lives would be made by municipalities in which they do not reside as eligible voters and thus not directly represented in these decisions and municipalities may vary in their future vision and zoning court, enforce, zoning court enforcement. For example, we remember this example where the city rejected a, a project in the ETJ, but Law Park seemed to climb to favor a similar project. But the, the problem is with the developmental pressure that is happening now, we're getting into really complicated situations. And the concern is, the existing residents and their desire and their need to maintain the character of the place where they live is at risk. And that's what the complication in this issue is because it seems clearly it's jurisdictional and that's clear and it's not a problem. However, it does have these other ethical and moral dimensions that affects the lives of the residents when their home is at risk for a severe alteration from what is happening around them. So yes, it's straightforward, but we need to think about how does it affect existing residents and existing homes when there are forces coming in that have nothing to do 
with the jurisdictions. They have their own agenda, which is not necessarily compatible with the municipalities either. But there, there's this uh, pressure that comes in, and that's complicating the whole situation. But there needs to be um, a fuller understanding of the impact on the residents who, are, who have their homes here. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else? No, ma'am. Madam Mayor, before you close the public public hearing, I'd like to make a motion. Okay. I move that we leave the public hearing open until the December 2nd meeting and take our vote at that time prior to Council Member Miller leaving Council. Okay. Is there any discussion? All those in favor of continuing this public hearing say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. No. The ayes appear to have it. Uh, is it 4 1 or 3 2? I voted with it, and, but I would like to throw in explanations just because. Well, no, let me. I, wait a minute. Um, okay. So the vote is four in favor of continuing the hearing and one opposed. So the motion does ca uh, pass and the public hearing is continued. Okay. Now, um, in discussions with council on some of the legal uh, ramifications of this. She said that if we're going to discuss this and be able to ask questions, we need to go in closed session. So you made your motion before we ever had the chance to go in closed session. I, I, I yeah. just didn't want the mayor to close. It sounded like she was ready to close the public hearing, and I didn't want her to do that. All right. Uh, so at some point, we still have to have, I think, a discussion in closed session. It'll be at well, I don't know about closed session, but we will have discussion at the next meeting. I'm just going on what December else? 2nd. Okay. If if staff requests or if you request um, a closed session, we will have that. Okay. okay. All right. That is all for, of that for now. Uh, next item, prioritization of ARP funding. Who is leading this? Madam Mayor, as uh, City Attorney Beaker has come to the podium, this will be, okay. there will be several of us who will be speaking on this particular item. Um, Angie will give you the background and the, um, what she's learned from the School of Government and folks, and then we'll also talk about um, next steps and priorities. Okay. Thank you. Um, good afternoon again. Um, I have attended the School of Government and all of the folks that you see listed on this slide put together a six-day training course on the American Rescue Plan, coronavirus, state and local fiscal recovery funds. Um, and so I sat through the training and based on that um, have done a, an abbreviated training for staff and wanted to, in discussion with city manager, um, bring it forward to do an even more abbreviated training session for um, City Council so that you could become aware of um, more things associated with these funds um, and maybe take another look at um, our process that we went through before maybe we want to go through a little bit different process now that we know more about these funds to determine how the city is going to spend the funds of course that's totally up to, to you all but um, I felt like it, I would be remiss if I didn't share at least some of what I learned with staff and with city council regarding these funds. Please stop me at any time. I'm going to go pretty quickly. Um, I will tell you I begged, borrowed, and stole a lot of these slides from that training. The um, reference at the bottom is the website where the full materials can be referenced. Okay, so <clears throat> just really briefly. Um, as part of the American Rescue Plan Act of 2021, $350 billion were set aside for coronavirus state and local um, governments. Uh, you can see a tremendous amount of money has been uh, set aside and designated by the federal government for other pots of money. And so the purpose for this slide is just to, you know, as part of the training and I think the um, philosophy in the local fis fiscal recovery funds is that 
if you can find another pot that might accomplish the same thing, it might preserve more of your local funds to do something that you might want to do locally. So it's more to make you aware of the other pots of money that were out there. Um, in North Carolina, um, in the bottom right hand corner is where we live. Um, right here there were $705 million um, of, available to be appropriated to non-entitlement units of which we are one. We are a non-entitlement unit, meaning that we have a population of less than $50,000. And that also means we don't get our funds directly from the people. federal. People. I'm sorry? 50,000 people. Oh, people. Did I say dollars? <laughs> sorry, my brain's gone ahead of what my mouth is saying. I apologize. <laughs> 50,000 people. Yes, 50,000 or fewer residents. Thank you. Um, so anyway, we don't, as a non-entitlement unit, get our money directly from the federal government. It passes through the state. And so normally we're considered a sub-recipient of federal funds, but in this case, we are actually still going to be treated as a recipient, not a sub-recipient. So the state will not be monitoring our compliance. The federal government will be monitoring our compliance. Um, these funds were broken up into two pots. Section 602 is the state portion, 603 is the non-entitlement unit portion. Um, you can see we got already a little $2.2 million, a little over $2.2 million um, of funds that was uh, based on population. It's being given out in two separate tranches of funds. And it says in the regulations that the reason is so that we can retain a little bit of flexibility before we have committed all of our funds to maybe meet the changing demands that may arise next year. And so that was purposeful on their part to, so that uh, local governments could retain some of that flexibility. Uh, in the regs, the latest I saw is that we expect June or July maybe of next year to get that second tranche of funds. But interestingly enough, the use of funds under both the 602 and 603 pot are exactly the same. So um, I've covered some of this already, um, I, but I'm going to cover each one of these a little bit more detail. Um, so one of the most important things to get out of the training, and I said this at the staff training too, is the timeline for funds. For federal funds, there's something called a period of performance, and that's with the time within which you have to use the funds. So for these particular funds, um, all of the funds have to be obligated by December 31st, 2024, meaning under contract, obligated to spend. They don't have to be spent yet, but they have to be obligated by that date. And they have to be fully spent uh, by December 31st of 2026. So those are hard deadlines right now. Who knows, they could extend them, but for now, any projects that you might want to do with the money, those are key, key things to keep in mind because they have to be able to be obligated uh, in, you know, by December 31 of 2024 and spent by December 31 of 2026. Um, March 3rd is a key date because that's the date that ARP went into effect. Um, and so that's really the beginning of um, the period of performance uh, and then December 20, uh, 2024 and 2026. So what are eligible uses of ARP funds? Um, they have to be eligible under three things. And the first is our state constitution, state law, and then allowable under the American Rescue Plan Act. So I'll touch on those in a minute, but one thing to remember about the American Rescue Plan Act is that all of the use of funds has to be evidence-based. Right? You have to determine that there is a need or an impact as a result of COVID based on evidence. Um, what's the harm and how will the funds address the harm? So you got to have evidence as to both of those questions before you use the funds for a purpose. There are some safe harbor uses that are listed in the interim final rule. And let me say that's all that the federal government has done is put out the interim final rule right now. Um, if you use one of those, they say you're safe while you're waiting the final rule. There are local governments that are waiting for the final rule to come out before they obligate or spend any of the funds just in case something changes or because maybe something new would be permitted that's not permitted currently. Just briefly under our Constitution, <clears throat> 
this applies to any expenditure of our funds, regardless of whether they're federal, state, or if they come from the state, federal government, or from our own tax base. Um, <clears throat> there's something called the exclusive emoluments, and it says no person or set of person is included to exclusive or separate emoluments, but in co consideration of public services. They can only be used for public purposes only. And benefiting the poor, the unfortunate, and the orphan is always a public purpose. And those, those three things are key when considering uh, use of these funds. <clears throat> Some of the goals of the ARP are to address the pandemic health issues, address negative economic impacts of the pandemic, compensate local governments for lost revenue growth, aid for low income areas and populations, and then longer term capital investments and critical infrastructure. Because the, the funds are trying to not only address the immediate need, but to also to build some capacity and resi resiliency in our population um, if something like this were to occur, again, to lessen the impacts that something else like this might have in the future. So these are some of the policy statements that are included in the interim federal, federal um, rule. They're targeting households, businesses, and nonprofits, most disproportionately impacted by the um, pandemic. They want to foster a strong, inclusive, and equitable recovery. And if these sound familiar, they sound a lot like your vision statements. Um, to provide retrospective premium pay for essential workers. Uh, consider projects to replace lead service lines. I thought that was pretty timely for us. <laughs> Consider green infrastructure investments to improve resilience to the effect of climate change. And then here's a piece that really was emphasized and came out through the training, and that is to in engage their constituents and communities in developing the plan to use these payments. Um, and somebody else is going to talk about that in a few minutes. Um, the implementation of the fiscal recovery funds also reflect, it's important that they reflect the public <coughs> public input, transparency, and accountability. Again, that should sound familiar <coughs> as, you know, your vision statements. So before we talk about what we can spend, let's talk about what we can't use it for. These are hard stops um, in the legislation. You can't use it to borrow money, make loan repayments. You can't do a rainy day fund. So say we want to set aside some funds to use in the future for affordable housing or something just kind of set it aside and hold it for something that would normally be allowed. We cannot do that because we have the dates that the funds have to be obligated by December 2024 and spent by December 2026. So un unless we're going to obligate and use them in that time period, we can't just set them aside and hold on to them. Um, so here are the five big categories of allowable expenditures. Some of them are well, some of them are obvious and some of them, if you didn't read the rule, you wouldn't realize it. But <coughs> to address the COVID public health, to address the economic impact, replace lost revenue, and that's talking about local government lost revenue, premium pay. That is one of the main five goal features or whatever of this legislation is to provide premium pay for essential workers. And then the infrastructure investments to invest in water, sewer, and broadband, which we can't do right now, but the water and sewer part, we certainly can. Um, <clears throat> so tied up in categories one and two, the public health and the negative impact is this kind of broader category. And as I said at the very beginning, they want to uh, use funds to help those that were disproportionately negatively impacted by the pandemic. And so they created like a subcategory that kind of overlaps both of these first two categories that um, if you are helping somebody who's disproportionately negatively impacted, they've done some studies um, and it's going to be presumed that those programs are as a result of the um, pandemic, that the negative impacts are presumed to be as a result. Um, so under those first two categories, the targeted beneficiaries, you can see here local government, the community, households and individuals travel and tourism and other impacted industries, small businesses and nonprofits. So those are the general targeted beneficiaries in those first two categories. But again, so you have to look in each category. So under public health, what's the public health issue and how is the project going to address it? Remember, it's gotta be evidence-based. What's the pandemic-related negative economic impact? 
how does the project address the negative e economic impact? And just for terminology's sake, um, anything that you use the funds for is considered a project under the federal rule. So, um, and each project that has to fit into what's called an expenditure category, and I'm going to should have handed these out before. Thank you. Um, so the reason I'm taking time to hand this out is because this is a real good short list cheat sheet of what you can use the funds for. They've broken it down into these categories that we're talking about, uh, negatively impacted, disproportionately impacted, public health, and every dime you spend you have to be able to fit into one of these expenditure categories. So can, can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you. Like under public health where it has 1.10 and 1.11 mental health services do you have to show that these were services provided because of covid so um it depends <laughs> it depends so there have been some studies that have been done well first of all we have to say can we do that as a local government okay okay as a local government we don't get into mental health but we do have some limited ability to provide some substance abuse services for the low to moderate income population so that's the first question but, um, but generally speaking, yes, it has to be related to the pandemic, but there are studies that have shown and, and evidence that you can gather that shows that mental health issues have, have gone up, substance abuse issues have gone up. So there's studies and evidence that are, is out there that you can grab to show that, yes, we want to provide this service to ameliorate some negative impact of the pandemic. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so this was like a, an aha moment <laughs> when I went through the training and that is if you are serving a uh, what's called a qualified census tract if you're serving a family that lives in a qualified census tract if you're doing a project that's targeted towards the pandemic in a qualified census tract you're pro you have a program that's providing most of its services in the qualified census tract it's going to be presumed to be because of COVID and, and addressing COVID. So you'd have less evidence because the federal government has already done the work in the studies. And so they've opened up this big broad category um, that if you're in a census tract or we have evidence of another population that was disproportionately impacted, there's a broader range of uses that can be done for those communities. Do we have that census tract information now? There you go. <laughs> so you know we have four qualified census tracts in Henderson County and I'm not a geographer I you know couldn't tell you start down here and go over there but generally downtown a lot of the communities you would expect to be in there are in there but there's some that you wouldn't expect necessarily to be in these qualified census tracts that are in there so um, uh, we are, we've talked about getting GIS to digitize this to, so that we can truly put it on a map. Um, these might be updated a little bit in 2022, so you would go by the qualified census tract as it exists on the date that you approve the project, you know, that, that you're going to use the money for. But So it opens up a wide <clears throat> geographic area where services could be provided with out a lot of extra evidence and justification and a broader array of services that can be offered in these areas. Yes, ma'am. Do we have any data on which qualification for the um, qualified census tract we meet in that entire purple range? Um, so the definition, as I understand it, is that more than 50% of the households in there fall within the low income category or more than 25% are at poverty level. Mm -hmm. so, so if you meet either criteria, it yes. falls in. And I, I don't have any more data than that. Okay. Sorry. I can, we can get it. We can, okay. we can get it um, from, the, from the census data. But um, okay. Any other questions? Um, so this is just reiterating what I just said, that services to address health disparities or negative impacts, just we're in the health, 
are presumed to be allowable in these QCTs. And some ideas are healthcare resources, public assistance programs, and building healthier environments. Um, some other ideas that they, that they had are um, things that are authorized under ARP is community health workers, um, pro programs that support early detection and timely management of chronic conditions, support for the elderly, and the reason I highlighted that is because we have specific statutory authority for cities to do um, support and programs for the elderly and, and then health education. Um, in a qualified census tract or a disproportionately impacted population, uh, one of the things was um, suggested to fund an evidence-based community violence intervention program um, or increasing access to behavioral health care services. As we just talked about, we really can't do the mental health, but we do have some limitability in the area of substance misuse treatment or substance abuse. Some other things that are specifically mentioned in the rule, food assistance, rent, mortgage, utility assistance, job training, emergency assistance, home repairs, weatherization, burials. These are all things that, especially in a qualified census tract, would be eligible uses, uses for the funds. Yes, sir. On the rent, mortgage, and utility assistance, can that be going forward? Or do, once again, does it have to be for the time period, I don't know, while we're in a pandemic? Both. Oh, it can be both. Some of okay. it could be both, yes. So the key with the obligation, the, the dates, is that um, you can't incur the obligation uh, before March 31st. Right. But if we incur an obligation after March 31st and in the period of performance, then I think we could um, provide some retro retroactive help. Okay. Um, depends on and what you'd want to look at. And I qualify all of this to say <laughs> the regs are like this thick and the uniform guidance that we're going to talk about is this thick that I would want to verify any anything. But, but generally speaking, yes, there is some ability to, to do that. Okay. Um, we've talked about this, about the QCTs. This slide just goes through some other ideas and things that are specifically listed in the rules as far as programs that you can have. This still, the, the red was kind of my notes that I took while the training was going on. Um, but most of our state law authority to do these things are in 160-1311, which is the community development statute. Um, and so that's why that's in a big red box. Um, again, some more safe harbor examples for local governments. Any direct expenses that we have that we can attribute to COVID, we can reimburse ourselves out of the money. Um, we can have programs and outreach. Um, I just talked about that. Uh, personnel costs. Some of these things aren't immediately apparent, like I said, until you start re reading the rules, but we can use... So, I, and I don't know what the numbers are. I'd have to ask Jennifer, our HR director, but if you looked at January 27th, the start of the pandemic, and compared our employment levels to today, if there's a disparity to where our employment numbers have gone down, we can use these funds to have programs to help bring our employment levels back up to what they were pre-pandemic. So in other words, the recruitment policy that you guys just approved and that we've put into place, we could reimburse ourselves some of that money as long as we document that our employment levels are below now what they were when the pandemic started. It's presumed to be because of the, the pandemic. Does recruitment mean like the video that we had made, not the raises that we gave our employees? Um, I thought it was the bonus for I, I was the thinking bonus more I mean, of the, you know, the retiring recruitment thing because that was more direct targeted towards I mean I guess you could make an argument that the raises were to help attract but part of that is also maybe making up for I, I don't know that that'd be a judgment call but we'd have to document it okay and have the evidence of it and then you could do it okay um, so we have had to provide paid family and medical leave for COVID, for people who got quarantined, we can reimburse ourselves that money. 
Um, we can reimburse ourselves some of the salaries for some of our public health and safety um, employees. Um, and then, self, well, I don't know that we do have self-insured expenses, but if we did, we could um, reimburse ourselves those. But then it, on this slide is also listed premium pay, which I'll talk about in a minute. So the third category, and again, like I said, I'm trying to go through this really quickly, is replacing lost revenue. So that's really intended to make the local government whole. So there's three pots of money that, um, that they brought out, and um, I'll talk about each one of those. But um, so the first one is investment earnings. So the, if we, like the $2.2 million that we have in the bank, our investment earnings off of that, you can use for anything. It's unrestricted. Normally that would be considered like program income that you'd have to put back towards um, the allowable purpose. But in this case, those investment earnings are just free and clear. You can do anything with them. And this is just a slide that talks about <laughs> investing. It's not much money. No, no, I love the picture. Oh, <laughs> oh I can't take credit for it. I wish Gr I could. Growing money. I just... Wish I could. The second piece is that you can, you can supplant. Normally with federal programs, you can't. But let's say that we had something in the budget that is an allowable ARP purpose that we already had budgeted local tax dollars for. We could supplant those funds with ARP funds and then use that money for some other general government expenditure. So you can supplant um, with ARP funds as long as what you were going to uh, spend it for is an allowable purpose and you still have to fo then you have to follow the uniform guidance um, and other federal requirements. Is that like if the lead thing if we... Yes, that's a perfect example. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Perfect example, yes. Um, lost revenue growth is the one that was in the middle. Brian tells me we can't take advantage of this one, uh, but generally local governments, there's a formula that you use, and if you can show, and you recalculate it every year, so you take your base year was 2018 and you compare your revenue for this current year and you have a growth factor that you assume you should have gotten based on past history and if your current revenues are less than what they should have been given that growth factor you can make up that revenue out of these funds and use it for any general government expenditures you still have to um, comply with some of the strings but we can use it for general government services. Um, okay. Next would be premium pay. Um, eligible workers to receive premium pay basically are any local government employee. Okay, so to, to qualify for in, uh, premium pay, it's eligible workers who are doing essential work. Eligible workers are. Um, See right there, it says any work performed by an employee of a state, local, or tribal government. So local government employees are assumed to be eligible. Essential work is basically work that you had to come in and interact with each other or handle things, touch things that other people had handled or touched. That's pretty much it considered essential work. It can't be work that was done at home. Premium pay um, is targeted towards your own low to moderate income employees there's a $13 per hour or $25,000 cap this in this one case the premium pay isn't you can't supplant because it's supposed to be in addition to what they make otherwise it wouldn't be a bonus it's supposed to compensate them for keeping things going and assuming the risk while others of uh, might not have done that may have stayed home worked at home or you know, um, anyway, there is a 150% limitation, meaning that the pay it is not, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. There's a 150% limitation that says that if paying them the premium pay will trigger, will bring them above 150% of the state's average annual wage, you have to have written justification. So in other words, it's targeted towards your low to moderate income employees. Um, to the premium pay. If you're going to give it to your other employees, you can do that. You just have to have additional written justification. Um, you can do it hourly in a single lump sum. 
um, basically however you would want to do it if you want to compensate, compensate people that you felt had assumed a, a, above and beyond risk um, a, as a result of COVID. And lastly, infrastructure investments. And this is the one that kind of surprised me, I guess. And that is anything that is eligible for clean water management trust funds or drinking water management trust funds is eligible for ARP funds. So if it would meet either of those two programs, it's automatically going to be considered to be eligible for ARP funds. But again, you see I have in green that the funds must be obligated by December of 2024 and spent by 2026. So I'm going to breeze through those. I want to talk a little bit about compliance with applicable laws because um, there's a huge administrative burden that goes with these funds. And this was the biggest eye-opening piece, I think, um, in going through the training and the biggest eye-opening piece for staff as well. So we have to comply not only with state law, we would do that anyway, but there's something called the Uniform Guidance that was put in place in 2014, and it is in place for any use of federal funds. So I felt like this six day was really a training on the Uniform Guidance and what its requirements are. And then of course, um, you have to comply with the award terms in the grant agreement, which says we're gonna comply with Title VI. We're gonna comply with wage requirements, all of those other federal laws that are out there we have to comply with uh, as a condition of getting these funds. So of course, state law we're all familiar with, 160A is our general statutes, 160D are planning, you know all about that. Uh, the local budget, local government budget and fiscal control act, and then article eight of chapter 143 is our public contracts and procurement statute. So we gotta comply with all of the things that we normally would comply with, but we also have to comply with the uniform guidance. So before this, I was only com uh, familiar with the procurement standards that, uh, for going out, if you're going to hire somebody to do anything under uniform, you've got to comply with the uniform guidance procurement over and above the state requirements. But I found out that there's a whole lot <coughs> of subparts D, E, and F. So I went into a lot more detail with this with staff, but one of the first things that jumped out to me is internal controls. We have to adopt a robust their words, not mine, a robust internal control policy so that every decision that's made has a check, check and balance, and can be documented that it was okay to write this check, it was okay to, you know, sign off on that contract, that this policy, every, everything we do, we have to have an internal control policy for. Um, I talked about the procurement standards a little bit. Um, performance and financial monitoring, there is whole cash management policies and cost accounting principles, 150 pages of cost principles of what you can and cannot charge to this money as far as costs, what qualifies and what doesn't, direct costs, indirect costs. Auditing, all of the audit requirements, I mean it's a tremendous administrative burden that goes along with these funds and I think that none of us realize that. Um, you know, before, prior to this. Um, I want to go into a little bit more on subrecipient monitoring and management because that's kind of what we're here to talk about a little bit is the, <coughs> how are we going to distribute these funds to some subrecipients in the community so that they can put some programs in place to, to benefit the community. Uh, and by that I mean the, the nonprofits. So the big first thing, remember I started out with the Constitution and no private emoluments. Okay, we have to contract with, not donate to. We need to erase from our vocabulary any donation of public funds. We cannot gift public funds to anybody. We have to get something for the funds. We have to get either services or some sort of public benefit as a result of the funds. And that's the North Carolina constitutional restrictions that I started out talking about. So the first thing that we have to do when we are um, considering our nonprofits is we have to decide what kind of contract are we gonna enter into? Is this gonna be a contract or a subaward? Remember I said we were the recipients of this money? We're not a subrecipient, we're a recipient. Well, we are gonna have subrecipients when we 
um, allow a nonprofit to take some of this money and start a program with it, we are going to be entering into a subrecipient relationship with them in most cases. Sometimes it's going to be a contract relationship, but the very first thing we have to do in evaluating any expenditure of funds is, is this going to be a contract relationship or is it going to be a subrecipient relationship? So, if it's for a contract relationship, we've got to go out and do all the procurement. We can't just go out and hire somebody. If it's a subrecipient, we have to impose all the burdens on them that we would normally have as a subrecipient. They have to do everything that we have to do. They have to have all the same policies. They have to comply with all the same laws. And um, we have to monitor and the responsibility for making sure that all of our nonprofit partners are doing everything they need to do is ours. The federal government will look to us uh, to make sure that our subrecipients have done everything that needed to be done under the uniform guidance. So I said the first thing we have to do is discover, determine whether they're a subrecipient or a contractor. The second thing we have to do is something called a risk assessment. Totally new. We have to look at the nonprofit and we have to assess how experienced are they in handling federal funds and in meeting all those federal requirements. If they're federal, fairly new to it, then we have to have a higher standard of monitoring. If they've done it a lot, it's a lower standard, but we actually have to go through that exercise for each uh, subrecipient <coughs> to do a risk ass assessment. Based on that, we have to do a subaward agreement and then we have to monitor them. We have to do expenditure reporting. There's more guidance that's coming out, but we have a very robust reporting requirement that we'll have to do for these funds. And then we have to adopt policies and procedures to govern everything that I've talked about that I've just scratched the surface on. So there's quite a lot of work um, that is going to be required for this. On this part right here, mm -hmm. To be sure, the School of Government can come out with some generic ones that we can copy. <laughs> They're working on some, some um, they won't do a, like just a blanket policy that we can just adopt. It's got to be tailored to your jurisdiction, but they are going to have a framework, come out with a framework and maybe s some suggested language, but the message was you really have to take it and make it your own because everybody's doing this differently. So they're working on it, though. Would this have to rise to the level of being an ordinance? It is not. Okay. It would just be a po no, it wouldn't be an ordinance, but it definitely would be um, policies and procedures that um, will basically be developed behind the scenes. Um, you, you know, staff will have to work and develop these policies and procedures and, and, and bring forward. So now what we have, this is staff work, right? To develop all these policies and processes and checklists and establish all of our document creation and retention practices, because I didn't even talk about records retention, and train everybody um, and a lot. There's a lot. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to city manager to talk about Moving forward. Thank you. Mayor Bolt, members of City Council, before we proceed with kind of how, where we were before and where I think we ought to go next, I, I just want to bring this slide back up and something that we've been talking about as a staff, and Angie talked about the uh, administrative burden, is we, we can use some of these funds to assist in meeting compliance. And one of the things that we have talked about, not only among ourselves, but also um, with the, the county staff, as the county staff has been looking at this and other local governments is possibly, you know, even in our case is taking some of this money where we hire someone who specializes in grant administration, who one person who would be permanently or specifically dedicated to handling the COVID money, the ARP money, and making sure that we, not only that we are compliant, but if we do um, contract or sub, provide money to subrecipients, they would be the go-between and they would specialize. They would live and breathe ARP funding every day. So that's something I know that 
land of sky is talking about for other local governments, but it may be something that we look at as it relates to a grant administrator, which would help us not only here, but in other grants where we're receiving. So, and we can use ARP money to fund that position. So that's something that I think we'll definitely be talking to the city council um, at your January meeting. You're talking about hiring someone just for us? Yes. Like not sharing them with anybody yes, else? I am. At this point, right. I'm talking about hiring. Yeah. yeah. So yes. That, that's one that. enough. <laughs> After listening to all that, I just I'm, yeah, yeah. So one enough that would be embedded in our finance department to um, to track the money. So that's something I definitely want to talk about. Uh, so these these were the original ideas when you know this. I'm from the government. I'm here to help. They drop this money in our lap. We're like, hey, this is how we're going to spend the money. So I'm not going to spend much time on this. This is what we had originally thought about allocating money. I think we still need to allocate. Um, the $2.5 million for the UV replacement project, that is, that is a critical project. But I think if you go, all these other funds are something that I think we're definitely interested in, but we have some work to do before we allocate th these, this money. So, um, and let me talk about how I think I want, we want to do that, or how we will propose. So here are the eligible uses. I won't go through that again from what Angie talked about. She gave a great explanation of those eligible uses. So one thing that I think that we talked about as a staff is Angie talked about the idea of, of having it being evidence-based decision-making, um, get input from the community is one thing that we think we should, the city council um, should definitely do is develop clear goals and objectives on how you want to use those funds because if we are ever, when we are audited, we need to have the evidence that we went through a thoughtful process of how the money is going to be spent. And, and have clear evidence that there's a need in our community for whatever we spend the money on. Um, and so what we would do is we would use, our proposal is that we use the city council core values and beliefs as the foundation of the evidence. That would be our foundation. We would like to take the month of January um, to seek citizen input on the, on the community's greatest needs. Um, also utilize, um, we have lots of nonprofits in our community um, and I'll share those in just a few minutes that have, have taken the time to submit grant applications. We'd like to use those to assist in, I mean, because they, they've done a lot of research um, into what the needs are in the community. Um, utilize those grant applications to assist the development of potential goals and objectives. And then ultimately, also, there may be other areas that city council has, <laughs> has specific desires on how you would like to um, use this money um, to improve our community, um, such as affordable housing, infrastructure, um, specifically the Connection Center. We've talked a good bit about that. But to have that evidence-based, clear <laughs> goals and objectives that we can embed in our policies and in our guidance and put it as part of the, the critical decision-making documents will help us in the future as we are audited and as people ask how, how and why did you spend the money that way. So that would be something that we would recommend to council. So we, we're, rec you know, as at the end of this, we'll get to the next steps. But I just something I want to point out that we feel like you got to have um, clear goals, and we've got a good foundation with your core values and beliefs, um, because a lot of things I think you want to focus on are in those. Um, but we also would like to see some public, seek some public input around the community um, on how they would like to see. And I, that's been encouraged. As I think the mayor even talked about that early on. Um, when some of the meetings that she participated in, they were talking about public input as well as the guidance we got from the school of government. Um, so kind of a, 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 plan, a plan going forward again is that we have public input meetings is scheduled in January and February. At your workshop meeting in February, develop the draft goals and objectives. I'm realizing that we have this window of time that we have to obligate and then spend it. Um, utilize um, the goals and objectives to set spending priorities at your March meeting and then allow the nonprofits to resubmit the applications based on the new goals and objectives um, and then set priorities um, ag again at the, at the May 5th meeting. So, that, <coughs> Yes, sir. Is the May 5th meeting our budget meeting or our council meeting? So that is, actually that date is your regular council meeting. We okay. could do it as part of, you know. No, 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 no. Yeah. I do not want to, mm -mm. I want to keep the budget separate. Okay, no. yeah, so this is. That's why I was asking that question. Yeah, that is your regular meeting. So those, um, that is just a proposed, toss it out now for ideas, trying to give everybody time to, 
to do what they need to do. I know that's, you know, lots of nonprofits would like to have the money um, in hand much sooner than that. However, we, with the uniform guide, guidelines and um, our uniform guidance and us to get our ducks in a row, we felt like this is a relatively conservative path going forward and, and can get our policies in place and our evidence based decision making in place. So that would be our proposal to you. So let me stop right there and invite Allison out to talk a little bit about community engagement and how we would propose to do that in um, uh, January and February and then I'll come back and talk about next steps. Thank you, Mayor and Council. I will not belabor the point because Angie and John have done a great job um, reminding us of the new guidance coming out and the importance of community engagement. Um, but I will say they align directly with your values that you've established. Two that I wanted to highlight is that um, one of your values was decided to be that the city would share information and solicit feedback from the public before they implement new programs and policies and your importance that you're placing on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, as we move through this public engagement process, we will want to be clear that we will not be able to um, accomplish everything the public would want with these limited amounts of funds, but that we do want to hear from them and then provide you all with that information as you make your decisions. Um, some of the things we've discussed uh, facilitating for January and early February is at least one public um, engagement meeting specifically for ARP funds. We'll be discussing the best method to deliver that, but we do want to have at least one in-person option and either a hybrid virtual option or a separate virtual meeting. Um, we're going to be creating an online survey that will have paper copies available at the in-person meetings that will be online. Um, that survey will make sure is in English and Spanish. And as far as getting the word out on trying to solicit information from diverse populations, we definitely want to bring a presentation to your diversity and inclusion committee in January, as well as uh, there's a the potential to go in front of other boards to make sure we're reaching the community and underserved populations. Uh, we do want to provide materials to some of our nonprofits who are working in those circles as well to try to beef up the um, the cross-section that we're hearing from and not just the typical folks who come to the meetings or participate in our regular public comic sessions. Um, we'll be using a variety of methods to get the word out on this uh, in late December and January using all our social media channels and partnering with other organizations to try to get the word out. Um, and then as John mentioned, as we move through this engagement process, we'll provide um, the survey reports and a report back to you all so that you can hear hear that feedback summary, but you'll also be welcome to come to any of the engagement events that we have as well to hear firsthand as well as part of the report. Yeah, it looks like the, I'll jump in here. This is Alex, uh, intern that presented earlier. Uh, I'm virtual from Chapel Hill right now. But I just wanted to give an overview of some of the applications that were already submitted uh, from the nonprofits just to kind of give you a sense of who has uh, we kind of apply for this funding. So we have received, received applicants from 22 organizations uh, and the total amount from those applications combined was around $2 million. Uh, so some of the examples for the projects, and this is a, kind of a broad over here. I, I apologize if I miss anybody that uh, uh, submitted an application, but there was a, a lot of requests for funding for staffing positions at nonprofits, uh, some efforts to assist senior citizens in their housing, uh, efforts to build affordable housing and improve existing housing, uh, some community education and outreach on COVID pre prevention efforts, specifically in non-English speaking communities. There were some requests for funding for arts and educational programs, some requests for supporting free clinics and other health practices, uh, requests for environmental protection e efforts, and some food assistance programs. So just to reemphasize, we're still in the process, as, as Angie and John alluded to, of kind of determining what we have the authority to fund and, uh, and reopening these applications, but I just want to make sure we acknowledge the nonprofits that have uh, submitted these applications and, and uh, having, having read them, they were very well, very well prepared, and uh, we, you know, we'll communicate with nonprofits when we uh, decide to, to reopen that process and, and kind of get into what John was saying. So, thank you. Can we ask Alex a question? Yes. Sure. Thing. Yeah. Um, so, Alex, one of the things that Angie mentioned 
more than once was evidence-based needs is that part of these applications do they provide something that's would give us some evidence-based information as far as that part of the grant yes yeah that was that was in the initial application we had a we had a section where they uh, the, the nonprofits could kind of elaborate on uh, the need for the project and how, how it related to covid um, when we're you know redoing this application and, and we'll be working with angie and and whoever else on this, to, uh, if we had need to add some more clarifying information in there, that might be part of this uh, a new application we'd send out. But yes, that was definitely a part, and there was definitely sufficient evidence from a lot of the nonprofits that submitted applications um, as like as the validity of their project to, to COVID. So, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Alex. Thanks. <clears throat> so next steps. Uh, we would propose that we establish the community engagement meetings um, and then move forward with goals and objectives development and then once we move through the, the first phase right after the first of 2022 develop your spending priorities um, continue to develop a comp in and some of this will be on parallel paths we would while we're having community engagement and goals and objectives we'd also work on the compliance some of the compliance plans uh, we want to communicate uh, with our other local governments. There is an ongoing uh, group of local governments in the county who are meeting. Um, the mayor participates in those meetings to discuss how we're spending money to make sure that the money is, um, we, we get as much money into the community in, in, in diverse way and um, as many different projects can possibly be funded from different pots of money as we possibly can. But communicate with them and also work with our nonprofits and then you know the 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 big thing waiting out there is that final rule. Hopefully, the the final rule will come at some point. Uh, we would hope definitely before you made your final decision, so we could look at that. But that is out there. But that is our proposed next steps. And and part of this is again coming back to you, um, and in the interim and looking at such things as grant administration. Um, you know the, the 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 compliance plans, the policies that we had to have in place. Um, so that we can not only be prepared ourselves, but we have to um, work with our nonprofit partners and then ultimately um, move forward um, by the spring of the year and we'll have a much clearer picture. So um, I think that is everything we have. Um, Angie, anything else that we may have missed there or anything else you think you want, we want to add? Uh, not at this time. Any other questions? general we feel staff is going in the right direction on this mm -hmm. okay all right thank you. thank you a lot of work has gone into it already thank you okay uh, next acceptance of dogwood trust grant for Hendersonville Connection Center mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, and everyone is free to stay or leave as they, they wish. Oh, oh. <laughs> I'm used to people going in and out uh, as they choose, so. Yeah. Uh, uh, Mayor, along the lines of uh, what we were just discussing, um, we did, the city did apply for a grant um, in the amount of $1.5 million to assist in the development of the Hendersonville Connection Center. Uh, it is a grant um, from the Dogwood Health Trust. We were awarded the grant. Um, it's a grant that we will get the money and then can then um, lots of uh, contractual work and things that we'll need to work through with, um, with the Connection Center, but the 1.5 um, um, money can be used to develop it. There's, we believe, um, fewer um, strings attached to this money, a good bit, not as much as the ARP money. Um, and we're asking staff to approve the grant agreement um, in order to receive the funds and then we will begin um, over time working not only with distributing these funds to the Connection Center but also um, there is um, some additional matching money with the fund the Collection Center will need that will work with the county and the, t and the town of Laurel Park um, to try to get that money in their hands to, to fund the Connection Center so um, just at this point need a motion to accept the or adopt a resolution authorizing us to execute the grant agreement with Dogwood Health Trust. Okay. Any questions first for Mr. Connie? 
not, if someone would like to make a motion. Madam Mayor, I move that the City Council adopt the resolutions authorizing Mayor Volk to execute the grant agreement with Dogwood Health Trust as presented. Is there any discussion? No. If not, those in favor of the motion to uh, execute the grant agreement say aye. 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 Those opposed say no. The ayes have it. It is unanimous. And uh, I'll sign it whenever I get it. Okay. We'll send it to you. Thank you. All right. And finally, Senate Bill 300 Ordinance Amendments. So, Mayor Volk, uh, Ms. Beaker, and the Chief by hand, and I will also tag team um, another set of regulations um, coming through that we will have to meet. And so, want to take time that uh, in just a brief this will be a brief presentation there's lots to work to do in this particular but want to make you aware of senate bill 300 um, is it's uh, i guess name for it in in the public is the um, criminal reform bill um, and so what i'd like to do is if chief myhan will talk about some of the things associated with the police department and how he is trying to address the requirements of senate bill 300 and then Ms. Beaker and I will talk about some of the city code ordinance requirements that we'll have to meet as part of the city code, and we'll ultimately need direction from the city council in the future about those provisions. So, uh, Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council. Blair Myhand, your police chief. So Senate Bill 300 is now state law. The governor signed it into law a few weeks ago. Some of the requirements happened October 1st, but we have a, our next deadline, big deadline of December 1st to get some uh, very significant things done. So specifically to the police department, there are uh, four things that I'll make you aware of. So we have um, uh, what is called Giglio material. So if a law enforcement officer has uh, any untruthfulness or bias that's known that is something that's reportable to the, the criminal courts you know to the da now it's required to be to um, for us to notify uh, the training standards criminal justice training and standards uh, it's not really an issue for us if we have an officer who's untruthful they won't uh, remain employed with us because it's it's critical that citizens can trust that officers say what they um, you know what's actually true on under oath on the stand so but we now have a, a a form to report that to the state automatically you know whenever that happens we also have to report any officer involved in a death or serious bodily injury to to another person so if an officer uses force again we, we would normally uh, retain that information here within our department but now we have to report those things to the state criminal justice training standards has forms for us to do both of those uh, the next two biggest things are uh, relate to use of force so we have to uh, add duty to intervene in our policy so uh, it was already previously in our policy I'm working right now with with the executive staff to completely revise our use of force policy I think it was uh, somewhat a little bit out of date so we're we're uh, in the process of reviewing that policy and and putting the, uh, I think some more structured procedures in place to make sure that we're capturing use of force information and, and, and reviewing those those things. So we're prepared to do that by December 1st, which is the deadline. And the last thing specifically is an early warning indicator. So uh, we, we do that already as best practice in, within the department, but the state now mandates four specific areas that we have to track uh, officer involvement in. So uh, those are uh, again, any discharge of a firearm, so that in, our attorneys believe that includes uh, discharge of a, of a wild animal. So if we fire our gun at an injured deer, that is something that we would report. Uh, uh, any any com citizen complaint against an officer is, is recordable. Motor vehicle crashes, uh, and then any serious use of force, which is... Um, um, you know which we already track so those things are statutorily required we have a couple other things in policy again that policy is under review and uh, we'll have it effective no later than December 1st the the issue with early warning tracking so the idea is that is that we we monitor officer behavior so if 
uh, if there are, is a pattern of, of troubling behavior, we identify it and we address it before it turns into some catastrophic event. And so we do that right now through just an Excel spreadsheet. So the, the process is that my assistant, Melissa Justice, has to enter this stuff into a spreadsheet and then go, hey, oh, Chief, by the way, I think there's, a, there's a, a, um, an indicator here. So, so many complaints within a certain amount of time or a combination thereof. So that's sort of ripe with, uh, you know, failures. You know, you're not paying attention. Don't enter it in time. And so we're looking at some, some software. There's a lot of providers that are obviously paying attention to this and developing software to to do that for us. Again, it, it requires manual input, but the, the, the software would automatically hit, you know, seeing a, a, you know, an alert when there's some sort of qualifying event. Uh, and so I'm looking through some of those, but of course those all come with some sort of monetary um, cost to them, probably a, you know, a few thousand dollars a year. I think that's what we're looking at for most of these uh, providers that do that. So we're, we're in good shape by December 1st. We'll, we'll be completely compliant. Uh, with the new state law, it's just a matter of how we're going to uh, manage this procedure over over the coming years. But uh, so, any questions y'all have of me? Yes, Jeff. What is a serious use of force? How do you break that down? So the the, the state has has a definition of it. So it's certainly anyone that it, that involves death of another person or serious bodily injury. And so they they identify. I mean, obviously, death is is doesn't need a definition but they they identify or define what serious bodily injury is so you know what you and I think that is might be different things but the, the state has a very clear definition of it that um, you I guess know, I just wonder how much detail you have to do like uh, if you use a taser or if you have to do you have to report all of those specifically not to the state so again we would look at ones and, and, I, and I would and I would probably seek some guidance if we had one that was uh, an injury to a person to see if it's a qualifying as a serious bodily injury or you know because I mean someone you know we could use let's say in your example we, we could tell you somebody they could fall over and break their arm right. uh, I don't think that qualifies but we'll make sure that we remain compliant uh, you know with with whatever the definition yeah, I was is so wondering how far they they took that because it understanding where the mission is and where to go is but it would wear you out book work on some things I was just curious well, that, that information, once we do report it, will be in a database only available to law enforcement agencies. So, again, what, we're, what the state is trying to do is, is, a, is prevent uh, officers who have a pattern of misconduct or, or bad behavior from going around to different agencies and, and remaining in law enforcement. I think everybody can agree that we want only the most qualified people and, and those that are demonstrating behavior. Again, we're, what we're trying to do is avoid those catastrophic incidents and and not just get rid of people, but address some of these issues with, you know, with whatever you know sort of resolution we need before they turn into problems that impact an entire nation. Yes, Jerry. Do you anticipate the reporting of this would require any more additional administrative help? I don't think so. I mean, we we already track, you know, we we do use of force reports separate and apart from the incident report. We review that internally. I think you know the reporting to the state is going to be sporadic. I mean, since I've been here, we've not had a use of force that would have been a qualifying event under under the new state law. So I think those are few and far between. <laughs> right. uh, and so you know, I, I don't think that we're going to need any additional help to be able to do this. I don't think it'll be a heavy lift. It's just where where things were were best practiced before. Uh, now they're state law, so they're 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 really holding everybody's feet to the fire and making us report these things because I'm sure there's a lot of agencies that that you know aren't accredited or didn't didn't follow some of these best practices that a lot of other agencies do and the follow-up sort of what to Jeff asked or your response to Jeff was this information cannot be or can it be obtained by freedom of, freedom of information request you said it went into a database for law enforcement agencies if someone wanted to request this information, can they do that? Is it available? Well, my understanding is that this is a confidential database for law enforcement agencies only. I okay. would defer probably the more legal right. answer to that the purpose question. Purpose of it Angie, is, but, strictly but it, it's, not, it's not intended to be a public uh, database that people can see. It's only for, for me as an agency. If I have an officer apply, I can 
call train and standard and say, is this person on your list? And then make a, you know, an additional inquiry into that. But gotcha. Anyone else? Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chief. <clears throat> so another part of this legislation is, um, I don't know if you guys remember two or three years ago, we had to, as cities, report to the state's a legislative study commission all the potential criminal violations of our local ordinances. And so everybody did that. And so they took that and now one of the results of the study commission is in this bill to where they are decriminalizing a lot of our local ordinances. <clears throat> so, uh, and it's effective December 1st. The, it only came out in September, but there's, there's a lot more work to be done than could be done <laughs> between September and December by the city. So, um, in the past, it's always been a presumption that you could enforce any city ordinance by criminal remedies. And in fact, our code has a general provision in it that says any violation of this code can be enforced criminally. Well, after December 1st, um, only the ordinances that we have specific language in may be enforced criminally. In other words, one example that we have currently that does meet the test is um, disorderly conduct, public, public disorderly conduct. It says specifically in there, if you do this, you can be charged criminally. Most of our ordinances say though, it's unlawful to do this, it's unlawful to do that. And it relies on that general criminal penalty. So we as a city, you as city council are gonna have to decide what do you want to be enforced criminally and what do you not? Now, there are some um, areas that they've already decided for you that you may not enforce criminally any longer. And one of the biggest ones is Chapter 160D. Any land planning ordinance may no longer be enforced criminally except building code and minimum housing code violations. Those are now the only, if you're enforcing an ordinance under 160D, you can no longer enforce it criminally. So. Um, one of the things to think about as so this is more of a foreshadowing of what's to come it's a you know <laughs> um, but one of the things to think about when you're trying to decide whether to decriminalize or not is well um, it used to be well we don't want to give somebody a criminal record for violating a, a city ordinance well this new legislation has basically given a huge defense to criminal enforcement. In other words, if you got arrested for drunk and disorderly conduct, okay, and it goes to court, they've now um, input um, defenses that say, if you can show proof of compliance, then you're not gonna be convicted. So in other words, proof of compliance, what does that mean? It means that either you show you've had not had any more violations within a 30 day period, or that you um, have undertaken some sort of professional help to deal with the circumstance that may make it harder for you to comply, i.e. substance abuse issues, homelessness, those kinds of things. So if you can show you've entered into some sort of counseling or something, you won't be convicted. <clears throat> and why did they do that? So the bat, they, there was a lot of negotiation that I understand went, went on and they, they did it that way to strike a balance because there are many things that still need to be a, cr a crime because law enforcement, and Chief can chime in here, but law enforcement needs to be able to address and handle the situation at the time. So it kind of strikes that balance. It gives law enforcement the tool they need to remove somebody from a situation before it escalates or gets too bad that they wouldn't be able to do if it's not a crime. But yet, that person isn't necessarily going to end up with a criminal record just because they violated a city ordinance, if, if that makes sense. So um, the other thing I will say is that um, these ordinances can't be enacted on the same day as introduced. They want you to be really sure that this is what you want to do if you're going to make something a criminal, uh, a crime, a violation of a city ordinance, a crime. So. Chief Myhan has already provided uh, a starter list of things that from a law enforcement standpoint he would like to see remain a crime. Um, things that like disorderly conduct, gambling, 
um, <clears throat> disturbing the peace, unlawful assembly, fighting, those sort of things that you would expect to be crimes. But um, above and beyond that, we're going to have to look at every provision and you all come to you all for guidance so that you can decide what you want to be a crime and what not. Now, in the meantime, we're not totally without enforcement remedies because everything can still be enforced with a civil penalty or a citation. Um, so, you know, it, it's not like we aren't going to be enforcing our ordinances in the meantime. It's just that um, we won't be enforcing all of them criminally between now and the time that you all would make those decisions. So you mean to tell me there are some things that are crimes that are about to not be crimes as far as taking them to jail? Yes, but, it, but it's going to be up to you all to do so right now. So many of your ordinances say it is unlawful to it is unlawful to do this, but it doesn't specifically say it's a crime because in the past you could rely on that general catch all provision that enforce you know violation of anything can be enforced criminally can be a crime so now we're going to have to pick and choose go through and say well we want this to be able to be enforced criminally and we don't any longer want this to be enforced criminally and every everybody's having to do the same thing cities and counties across and the whole state. I understand that but my question is is there something some glaring thing that only has the unlawful language in it that would be something that we would want someone to you would be able to take them to jail if they did that is there anything like that in our code right now because we're going to have the span of time where you can't do that I, i'm sorry i didn't understand your question so i did go through and do that analysis <laughs> okay so that was my question <laughs> okay so the ones that um i can point to right now that have the specific language in that would be um Drinking in public places, uh, urinating or defecating in public, disturbing the peace, uh, unlawful possession of dangerous weapons, possession of firearms by convicted felons. Um, those are the most obvious ones. There are others, though, that, yes, you're right, are not going to be able to be enforced criminally until we get this in place. Okay. That concerns me a little. Well, so, Jerry, I, I'm not saying it's anybody's fault. I'm just saying it, it concerns me. A lot of these are covered under state law, so okay. we can enforce All right, thank state you. law. But All where right, we're right. there, there's some, you know, sometimes municipalities have something that the state law doesn't cover because it's sort of germane to our area. Those, and until they are remedied, uh, we would be okay. unable to enforce them criminally. And so, and correct me where I'm wrong with this, Angie, but. It, the state also limits the misdemeanor to a class three misdemeanor and the civil penalty to no more than five hundred dollars so there's also that that cap on in class three misdemeanor is the lowest level misdemeanor mm -hmm. so that's always been the case yes okay. that hasn't changed right but many of these things are covered in state law which is still in place right a lot a lot of ours are okay. I mean, like the All firearm right. possession of a firearm by felon we would almost always charge that under state law okay thank you and so that'll be part of the analysis too about does it need to be in the code um, Angie and I had that conversation today if it's if it's chargeable under state law does that need to be in our city code and it allows us to do some code cleanup that you know reduce some of the language and that kind of, you know why would you need it in both places if, mm -hmm. if they're going to charge under the under the right. state law and those kind of things so thank you so we just wanted to let you know the exciting work that we have um, <laughs> in, in in the spring uh, or it's a winter that will be coming to you um, probably in bits and pieces maybe um, mm -hmm. to to make sure we um, go through all the code but we just want to make you aware of that and you may be hearing about it and reading about it and let you know the consequences and everything so okay further questions okay. so we'll Probably in a couple months, we'll start seeing <coughs> some of these things. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I would propose that we would put a lot of those on consent, and then if it's problematic, you got, you know, you would let us know. Um. Okay. All right. Thank you. I'd heard a little bit about that, but didn't really know the details. So appreciate the the background on all of that. Okay. We are at the end of our agenda. Thank <laughs> you.
when we left at 5.30. So we are adjourned. <laughs>